Hi, Gershom. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm doing okay. Uh, thanks for responding uh, on short notice to the call of duty. I just wanted to check in and get a perspective from Israel on uh, the seemingly uh, deteriorating situation in Gaza. Um, the, I, I gather the latest is that there is, there is a truce uh, there at the moment between Fatah and Hamas. Well, there, is a, a declared, um, a, there was a declared truce between Fatah and, and Hamas. And the latest report I've seen is that Hamas is claiming that Fatah has killed two more of its men in, in two separate incidents. So uh, that truce, truce seems to have lasted about as long as the truces in Beirut used to last during the Civil War. <coughs> I think part of the problem here is likely to be that truces are declared by uh, the leaders of the ostensible organizations, but what's happening on the ground is that uh, the various groups are not really following orders from the top. Uh, the, uh, Gaza is a collapsed state without ever having become an independent state. And so um, I think in many ways you're seeing a situation which is more similar to uh, Somalia or, or, or Baghdad than it is to uh, a, a conflict between two clear armies in a, in a, even in a civil war. And, well, that's and kind just of to disturbing. complicate matters even further, <clears throat> uh, Hamas has been firing rockets into Israel, um, apparently with the hope of dragging Israel into this conflict and covering up its own role. And uh, as a result, Israel has now sent at least a few tanks into the northern Gaza Strip to stop uh, the rockets from being fired and has carried out at least one air attack on Gaza City against Hamas. So, um, as usual, this is turning into a multi-sided conflict. Yeah, it does seem to have, in particular, these two basic dynamics. Um, Hamas versus Fatah, however disorganized both sides are, and to whatever extent it, it may be closer, as you say, to chaos than a, than a, than a bilateral conflict. And then this, this Hamas versus Israel dimension. And I want to get into both. First, I was just curious, how close does this feel to you in Jerusalem. I mean, the rockets being fired can, can, cannot reach Jerusalem, I gather. On the other hand, it is, it is you know, the, the nation is under attack when rockets are being fired into any town within Israel proper. Um, well, what is it? Is, is there a kind of a palpable sense of anxiety there, or what? Well, if you walk the streets in Jerusalem, you, people don't look like any different uh, than they would any other day, but I, there's certainly... I think uh, lurking behind that a certain sense of concern. I mean, uh, people clearly don't want a new entry into a full-scale war situation. Um, the country is uh, scarred from the war of last summer. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a situation in which uh, Palestinian uh, groups are attacking Israel proper is clearly a, a source of great concern. And, you know, if you look at the political scene, there's a lot of calls on the government to do something about this, as if there was some sort of instant medicine for it. <clears throat> Beyond that, I think that um, it adds to, it, it deepens the sense of hopelessness, which has been lurking on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian divide. For Israelis, you know, the, the point is, uh, how can uh, we, a uh, situation where we can pull out of uh, other occupied territories, if it's going to degenerate into, into this situation. I, I mean, I, I think that there are some partial answers to that question, but what it certainly does is it, it decreases uh, hope about a political situation. It, it, uh, it increases fear. It increases the sense that there's not even anybody to talk to on the other side because who's in charge? Uh, if, if the Palestinian Authority government can't stop uh, civil war, essentially, on, on its own side, <clears throat> if it can't get control of chaos, then even if you reach a deal with the Palestinian Authority, what possible reason would you have for thinking that they could enforce it? Right. Now, let me, uh, let's focus a little on the intra-Palestinian conflict and then get into the, the conflict uh, involving Israel. And, and let me try to set the background and probably make a mistake or two along the way, and then you can correct me. But the, certainly the Fatah Hamas thing goes you know, at least as far back to these elections more than a year ago. Uh, Hamas came out uh, having done well enough in the elections to 
run the government, but Israel and the United States said, no, we will not recognize your right to do that until you renounce your long-standing refusal to acknowledge the right of the state of Israel to exist. Otherwise, we'll be cutting off various kinds of funds, international aid, tax receipts that ordinarily flow, and so on. Um, and uh, that's kind of the way it... You know, it, it was for a long time. More recently, Saudi Arabia launched this initiative, stepping in, saying, look, no, sorry, we have a strong interest in Hamas being brought into the picture. They brokered uh, a deal where there was this kind of unity government, a sharing of power between Hamas and Fatah. And Condi Rice started, you know, doing a little kind of seemingly talking to Fatah with the understanding that then they would talk to Hamas, so there was maybe a kind of indirect communication. She was encouraging communication uh, between Fatah and uh, and uh, Olmert, your, your prime minister. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and that's the way things stood. And there, there, there was a, some seeming stability, I guess, in the wake of this Saudi initiative, which was, I don't know, a couple of months ago. Uh, but then there was kind of, uh, you know, growing kind of infighting between Hamas and Fatah. Uh, now, now, and it seems to have culminated, in, in, and now we seem to be maybe on the brink of what would is truly a civil war. Well, first of all, for, clearly the conflict between uh, Fatah and Hamas is a long-standing political conflict and one that has led to violence in the past. So the, the, the Saudi engineered deal led to this unity government, but it never led to a really functioning, uh, it didn't lead to that unity government becoming a reality in the sense of everybody's working together. It, it most importantly didn't lead to a situation in which the government gained a monopoly on force, which is of course the most uh, basic definition of a, of a state, uh, even a de facto state. Uh, the, the Palestinian Authority government was still left with the same. There were different and security services, and these security services also functioned, even though they're officially government agencies, also functioned as the, uh, as the militias of uh, either Fatah or Hamas, and no one official really gained command of, of, of all of the security services. So on the ground, in the streets, what you had is still a situation with armed organizations which were loyal to one party or the other, and, and the truce between them broke down, and then as a result of that truce breaking down, um, the truce with Israel also broke down. Uh, because in order for a truce with Israel to function, there has to be somebody in charge uh, who, who, can, uh, who can make this work. You know, I, I think what this comes down to is we forget sometimes that a state uh, basically depends on the idea that when somebody gives an order, other people follow it. That when a president says something and passes on orders to officials, then those officials pass on orders to, say, uh, the commanders of the armed services, and those people follow those orders. If that chain of command breaks down, then the state has evaporated, and in a lot of ways, that's what's happened in Gaza. Right, and in that sense, the, the tension between Hamas and Fatah, I mean, on the, uh, on the one hand, there is at the popular level, for example, uh, certain, certain kinds of animosity toward Fatah because of a history of corruption, and of course Hamas has capitalized that on building its base and so on. But I gather that what's happening right now has less to do with... Uh, with, with deep feelings at the popular level than it does to do with, like, one set of guys with guns uh, wanting, wanting the power and another set of guys with guns wanting to... You know, I know that's an oversimplification, but, but, but the no, point but is... No, what you're saying is... What you're well, saying is that, that, that there's less to do here with ideology than there is with the pure uh, desire for control on the ground. And I think that that's true. Now, I think it's also true that those who want power would claim, and uh, with uh, some degree of sincerity, that they want power to carry out their ideology. But carrying out the ideology is right now a distant thing, and the immediate thing is who's controlling the streets in Gaza City, who's got control of, uh, of the territory. Um, and it, it's a sort of, uh, it, it's really degenerated to the level of turf warfare. 
particularly because the Palestinian Authority lacks so many other aspects of control. It doesn't control its borders. That's controlled by Israel. Um, it hasn't really functioned as a government in Gaza since the Israeli pullout. And yet these armed groups are, are battling for control. And, and one thing that makes it even crazier uh, that, that people who are working in the field in Gaza are reporting is that uh, the same armed man may be the member of a, a supposed security service of a militia uh, affiliated with Hamas or Fatah and with a clan militia. You know, he's carrying three different identity cards. And when he's shooting his gun off, you don't even really know whether he's defending his clan or he's defending his militia or he's acting as part of a security service. It's, uh, try, you can't deal with this as chess in which there's just two sides on the board. This is an eight-dimensional board with 15 different players. Okay, and the uh, is there, as far as Israel's current relationship to this, I mean, first of all, are there a lot of people in Israel who think this is, in some sense, a good thing? That, in other words, they're better off having the Palestinians fight each other than they are having Hamas devote its resources to... I mean, leaving aside the fact, and we'll get to this, that Hamas is now firing rockets at Israel still, is there the sense that it's better to have the Palestinians basically distracted and consumed with infighting uh, than, 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 than focusing systematically their resources against Israel? I don't Israel? think that that's the case, because it's very clearly... Well, I, you can't separate that issue of the rocket fire into Israel uh, from the situation in Gaza. It's absolutely clearly cause and effect. I, I haven't gone out and done polling. I, I mean, I, there's, there, there's probably some sort of a basic emotional level would say, I'll let them kill each other. But the moment you're dealing with any kind of, of rational thinking, you immediately have to see that when there's nobody in charge, the guns go off. Now, if from an Israeli government perspective, and I think this is a perspective with which most Israelis would agree, they would clearly like uh, that government authority to be controlled by Fatah, which recognizes Israel and which at least officially is interested in some kind of political dialogue with Israel toward a political so solution of the conflict. Um, having Hamas win in Gaza would be a loss for Israel. Uh, Israel's problem on that respect is, is that it can't intervene on the side of Fatah because the one thing that would completely destroy Fatah's legitimacy on the street is for Israel to be seen fighting on its side. So uh, the Israeli government would, uh, would like Fatah to win this battle and to be able to impose its authority. It can't, um, it can't act in that direction uh, too much in the open because, uh, because in that case winning would be losing. Okay. Um, and I know this is ridiculously confusing. If you're totally lost now, then you understand the situation completely. Uh, I, no, I, I think what you're saying um, makes sense to me. Um, the, uh, so the, the motivation of the people firing the rockets, it seems to be Hamas, is, you know, I, I saw a characterization in one American press account that, that they want to, uh, the idea is to unify the Palestinian people against Israel. I think that's a slightly misleading characterization. I would assume that what Hamas wants to do is, you know, rally Palestinians specifically to Hamas's side and drain some support from Fatah in somewhat the way that Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, wanted to enter into conflict with Israel so that it would rally support uh, at the expense of the more moderate government of, of, of Lebanon, right? Is that your reading? Well, uh, the fact is that Firing the rockets into Israel is a sufficiently irrational move that it has provoked a number of hypotheses uh, of what could possibly explain this. In other words, I think that there's a <coughs> tendency, particularly among intelligent, rational people, to assume that somebody else's behavior must be based on some sort of intelligent, rational plan, and therefore let's come up with the political explanation there. So one theory has been that they want to uh, rally Palestinian support, show their legitimacy. They're the people who are really fighting the Israelis. Fatah isn't fighting the Israelis, but Hamas had a ceasefire with Israel before, uh, until uh, 
Another theory, which is that actually, is, and that it hopes that if Israel gets involved, it, it can blame the death on Israel and and avert uh, responsibility from itself. It could also be, and I, I, there's a strong possibility that this is the case, that there's a lot of lower level people in Hamas who were never really happy with the ceasefire with Israel, who felt that it restrained them too much, uh, who only want to use what they call military means against Israel and, and were unhappy with the Hamas leadership that was beginning to sort of age itself uh, uncomfortably a little bit uh, sideways into a political process. So the moment that order broke down in the Gaza Strip, these elements in Hamas said, okay guys, uh, the commanders are no longer in command and we can go back to what we like to do, which is shooting Israel. Okay. Well, let me ask, you know, kind of the same question in just a slightly different way. Who do you think on the Palestinian side would most clearly benefit uh, if Israel responds to the provocation in a very forceful, sustained way? Those elements, which includes uh, part of but not all of Hamas, who are completely opposed to a political process. Those people who say that Israel... Uh, will only meet our demands if we show force against them, uh, if it becomes too costly for Israel in terms of lives. Uh, that side of Hamas and the groups more radical than Hamas will feel that their position is strengthened if they manage to drag Israel into a ground battle in Gaza. Because uh, the whole hope of getting involved in a political process will, will, uh, will evaporate. And... On the Israeli political side, of course, going into this, the government was in serious trouble because of the, the Lebanon uh, experience. Um, both uh, Prime Minister Olmert and, and, and the uh, Defense Minister uh, Peretz. Um, now, the way these things tend to work generically is that, is that when a nation comes under fire, um, it helps, it, helps this, it strengthens the political leadership. Uh, you know, whatever its prior standing was. That tends to be the automatic response, that, that if rockets start coming into Israel, you would think the way politics works, the current government uh, is strengthened in its popular support. Is that happening? I don't think that that's the case here, and I think there's a couple of reasons uh, that it's not the case. One is that the government's particular weakness is because it's mishandling of a situation like this last summer. And so there's a lot of distrust of the government's ability to handle a military situation. Uh, that's the first problem that they have. The second problem is, I would say, a, a more generic problem, which is there's a, there's a basic problem in modern warfare, an asymmetry, that ironically states have a more difficult time dealing with what are technically called sub-state groups. Uh, it's, it would be easier for Israel to be confronting an organized state with somebody in charge than this uh, collection of militias. And because there's no easy military solution, there's less confidence in the government. If the government says, you know, we're going to go in with tanks and solve this problem, there's going to be people who say, hey, you're not going to be able to calm down Gaza with tanks. If the government restrains itself, some people will support that, and other people will say, how come you're not doing anything about the rockets? The lack of a, of a, of a clear-cut solution in military terms reduces the ability of the government to rally uh, popular support behind it. Right, and I assume that that lesson was driven home by the Lebanon experience, which, by all appearances, was really a much more kind of orderly <coughs> situation. In other words, when... When Israel launched its response, initially it cast it cast it, uh, it it said that the Lebanese government was responsible for what Hezbollah was doing by way uh, of firing the rockets. That was the way the thing was initially cast. It couldn't possibly make the comparable claim in this case, uh, which, as you note, know, is much more uh, chaotic. And and even in, in, in a more seemingly orderly situation in Lebanon, I mean, uh, yeah, as you suggest, I mean, th things, uh, things didn't work out well. So, so in your view, is all, of, is all of this going to actually inhibit a forceful response from, from the Israeli government? I mean, there has been some force applied already, right, there has, there, uh, it, over the last 48 hours yeah, by Israel. Yeah, I think that <coughs> what the Israeli government is trying to look for now is, uh, is pinpoint 
answers. Um, that's why, for instance, uh, they bombed a, a Hamas headquarters in Gaza. Uh, they sent tanks into a small area of the northern Gaza, Gaza Strip from which rockets are being fired, but they're trying, at least at the moment, to avoid a major incursion into Gaza, uh, which would end up with everybody turning around and fighting against Israel and wouldn't solve the long-term problems. Uh, the government's most likely options are ones that, that involve uh, picking its targets very carefully rather than getting deeply involved. That's not a, a very exciting or satisfactory solution, but it seems to be the, 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 the best of a bad lot. I would also want to add one important thing here, which is that the current situation has to be viewed. You know, you talked about it in terms of uh, Palestinian politics, the Palestinian elections of, of January 2006. I, I would just say that it's important to go back a year before that. And in the year before that, uh, Israel prepared to and then pulled out of Gaza unilaterally. And there was a lot of debate obviously within Israel about the unilateral withdrawal and even among those who supported getting out of Gaza uh, there was considerable criticism of the idea of doing so unilaterally without uh, negotiations, without it being part of a political process uh, with the Palestinian Authority and, and the critique that was offered at that time was that if you pull out unilaterally it will, first of all, it will look like a victory for Hamas, for the radicals, for uh, what Palestinians call armed struggle and what Israel calls terror, um, and that it won't leave a strong government in Gaza. Uh, the reason that the Sharon government uh, and Olmert at that time, who was deputy prime minister, did not want to do it as part of a bilateral process, as part of a negotiated process, is that they knew that to reach a political uh, solution with the Palestinian Authority would mean pulling out of virtually all of the West Bank as well. That The price in the West Bank was higher than what they wanted to pay. I think that, sadly enough, the critiques have been shown to be true. Instead of having a government in Gaza, we have a failed state. Uh, in the Palestinian public, Hamas was seen as the victor in Gaza, which certainly contributed to its electoral success. And the whole idea of unilateral withdrawals has been shown to be really disastrous. Yeah, the, and that critique of, of unilateral withdrawal was coming, uh, in a way, both from the right and the left, right? Absolutely. The, 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 the crucial difference was the right said, if you pull out unilaterally, it's going to lead to it being a Hamas mini-state in, uh, in Gaza, and so you can't do it. The right was saying that because they didn't want to pull out at all. The left was you know, agreed with the first couple sentences, but it said, and therefore, you have to negotiate with Abbas, with the uh, a, a, uh, Palestinian Authority. You have to make the pullout from Gaza as the first step in a negotiated process, because the left thing was to end the occupation in both Gaza and the West Bank and to reach a two-state solution. Uh, what Sharon was offering, you know, Sharon was essentially saying to the Israeli public, you know, you can get a Rolls Royce for $50. You can get rid of the responsibility for Gaza without paying the price of, getting, of giving up most of the West Bank and, uh, and agreeing on a, on a Palestinian state. Um, the $50 Rolls Royce has turned out to be, surprise, a con. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, in America... That maneuver by Sharon got very little criticism from kind of center left. Uh, the de the Demo standard Democratic Party affiliated people who analyzed these things said, "Oh, what a wonderful precedent that, that uh, you know Ariel Sharon, even Ariel Sharon, is now establishing the precedent of withdrawal." And, and maybe there was some virtue in that. I personally was skeptical along the lines you are, and. The, the one person I remember act, who knows something about it, actually speaking out to his credit, was Tom Friedman in the New York Times, uh, who said, you know, the way this should be done is, as I recall, he said, through, it, it should be done through negotiation uh, with Abbas. Uh, and it, it seems obvious that if you want to strengthen moderate elements uh, in Palestine, you want to make it look as if they have... You know, the, you want to give them as much credit for what's happening as possible, as opposed to making it look like you were chased out by terrorists. Um, 
and that I think was a, a, a prescient right. column in retrospect. Uh, the argument you've just given is, I think, correct. The most important thing within Palestinian politics, the most important goal, is uh, independence, is ending the occupation, uh, uh, setting up an independent Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And whoever seems to be getting successes on the road to that is going to be legitimized, and their methods are going to look uh, more uh, popular because they're, they're proceeding toward the agreed goal. And you don't think that this particular moment is a time when any of the kind of grand initiatives that have been floated lately, for example, the revival of the Arab overture of some years ago, about the Arab states recognizing Israel, which has, I mean, it has been revived, right, that, that in exchange for this and this and this and, and a two-state solution, the Arab states would actually finally recognize Israel. You don't see kind of that in combination with any kind of American support, the, the, the time being ripe for that to suddenly pay off? Well, I think that the Arab initiative was a very important development, I think that Israel should be uh, willing to engage the Arab League and the Arab states on pursuing that initiative. I think that ultimately the bottom line of that initiative, which is full normalization in return for a pullback more or less to the 67 lines, uh, is the right direction for a peace agreement. I think that the problem, uh, the, the, I don't expect there to be any serious American involvement here because I don't expect any serious American involvement in any kind of Middle East diplomacy at the moment. We've talked about that in the past. Uh, but I think it would be wise for Israel to engage uh, the Arab League on that point. The, the Arab League's biggest single problem, if Israel were to do that, is can it deliver the Palestinians? Um, you know, that would, be, that would be Israel's first question uh, to the Arab side. Okay. You know, we're willing to, we're in favor of a two-state solution. We're going to, uh, we're going to dicker with you closely on the exact line of the border. Uh, we're going to dicker with you on the issue of the right of return for Palestinian refugees. But our first question to you is, how do you propose creating a stable Palestinian state that can come through on its, uh, on its commitments? I mean, that, to me, that's the question that you have to address okay. to Riyadh and to Cairo and to Amman, is how are you going to do this, guys? And, and the prospects for being able to do that are deteriorating even as we speak, and that's what we uh, start off talking about. Uh, I'd like to be more optimistic, but, yeah, I think, that it's, uh, I, I think that it is deteriorating right now. And, you know, I would also say here we're, we've talked about the United States, we've talked about uh, the Arab states and everything. There is an issue here. Let's, let's get back to where we started. This is a battle. This started with the battle between Palestinians. And the real question is, when is there going to be a, a public backlash among the Palestinians against these armed groups? You know, when is there going to be a public protest on the Palestinian, from the Palestinian public in the West Bank and Gaza where people get together and say, have betrayed us with your fighting. We are sick of you. We're going to sit down in the streets and demand that you guys stop shooting. Um, I, I really think that that kind of grassroots power organizing um, is the critical missing factor here. Yeah, well, that's why I asked you earlier, and it was kind of a hopeful question, I guess. Uh, if indeed this is, at this point, the main animus is between groups of guys with guns, as opposed to having the kind of grassroots manifestation that you see in Iraq once the sectarian strife gets out of hand, right, where the Shiites really want the Sunnis killed and vice versa. I mean, I guess if there's good news, the good news is that the, the, the main driving animus here is so far at what you might call not an elite level, but, you know, uh, but, but to some extent it's among politicians and guys with guns and has not pervaded the grassroots in, in, in Palestine You yet. don't have, you know, even with the animus of Hamas and Fatah and their popular supporters, <clears throat> my impression is uh, that it's nowhere near on the level, say, of the Shiite-Sunni split in Iraq. I suppose if this keeps going, it could get there. Uh, I'm also going to be honest. I'm saying that uh, from a distance, because uh, since the kidnapping of Alan Johnston in, in, in Gaza, it has not been a place that particularly encourages foreign, uh, foreign journalists to come in there and cover it from close up. Uh, it, 
that's why most of the Palestinian groups had, had been uh, trying to avoid that kind of clash with the with the foreign media, and, and one radical group uh, broke that, and I think it's, it's um, reduced uh, the level of coverage from the inside in Gaza and therefore reduced our understanding of, of what's going on there. But with that bracketed in parentheses, I, I do think that, that there's more of a, of a shared society uh, one layer beneath this conflict. Um, and therefore there is a popular reaction against the violence, a popular demand for a ceasefire and peace, that that would be the essential element leading toward calm and also leading toward the potential for a political process. But there's nothing in particular you, you see that we can do to facilitate that? Um, the one thing that I think that is important that could be done from the outside is that if the offer of a political process is there from Israel uh, in conjunction with the Arab states, they're saying if, if Israel is, you know, was uh, willing to go to Mubarak and, and King Abdullah of, of, of Jordan and say, look, we recognize that this problem has to be solved. We're willing to engage in a political process, at least based on uh, uh, the Arab initiative as a starting point. Um, what we're waiting to see is the popular reaction on the Palestinian street. Here's the carrot. Come get it. But what you have to do to get it is to stop the shooting. It's possible that that might help galvanize grassroots opposition to all this uh, uh, conflict. Okay. Well, I hope, I hope you're right, and I hope somebody's listening to you. Um, and, thanks, and thanks a lot for taking the time. I, re I really appreciate this, Gershom. Um, I, I fear this will not be the last occasion uh, for us to have a conversation on this subject, but thanks. It's my pleasure. Thanks, okay, bye-bye.